Thanks, Father Steve. Well, truly, what better remedy to the COVID blues than to heed the words of this psalm that we just read out? It tells us that the Lord turns his eyes to the just and his ears to their appeal and invites us to taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Hey, Jesus is smiling at you right now, no matter how bleak things might be or might seem. In a nutshell, we're invited to surrender our worries once again into Jesus' arms and to experience something liberating, something so awesome that nothing can overwhelm it. And here it is in Jesus' words of eternal life. As St. Peter so magnificently put it, they are words that are both spirit and life. Spirit, because they lift us up and out of the miseries we so easily fall into. And life, because they give new purpose to an existence all too often centered on the flesh, as in the gospel, and on the world. And if that is where you find yourself right now, then again, you've come to the right place, even if only virtually. You see, love, God's love, is the best remedy, the best medicine we can have. And it's what is on offer right now, and to everyone, including those of you who are thousands of kilometers away from this church and utterly free of charge. Realizing that we are loved by God way beyond both present circumstances and all our wildest dreams, that will put a bounce back into your step and it will give you the key to a happy life. In fact, at the beginning of today's second reading, St. Paul gives us a very profound yet simple guide to a happy life, which is basically what every person in this world is looking for. He tells us simply and succinctly to follow Christ by loving as he loved you. Now, St. Paul here is paraphrasing Jesus' new com commandment to love one another as he has loved us. But it isn't a commandment based on either willpower or positive thinking. It is based instead on first being loved by Christ, as you are, warts and all. Imagining for yourselves the reality of the Lord's face, smiling at you, doting on you, as a dad would dote on his little daughter. Seeing yourself as the reason or one of the reasons why God made the earth and everything in it, as a playground and as a garden for you to grow and flourish as a child of God. Now, St. Ignatius of Loyola, in his spiritual exercises, tells us that by thinking or pondering or meditating about this, realizing this is how we can reach up and grasp the rays of God's love emanating out to us, how we can understand how well we are loved. We taste and see the goodness of the Lord in the words of today's psalm. You see, Christ's love for us is so good, so ennobling, so empowering, that once tasted, you'll always long for it over and over again, like with good food. <laughs> Hey, not trying to distract you, bad enough that this Mass is at 10 a.m. and lunch is just around the corner, I know, okay? However, personally, I just love a good baked dinner. You know, a succulent roast accompanied by baked potatoes and baked onions and pumpkin and carrots, you know, the list goes on, okay? And then unceremoniously drowned in gravy to complete it. <laughs> that was one of the things my mum used to cook so well back in Karama. Now, maybe that doesn't sound like heaven to you, but it's pretty close. And having tasted something as good as that and experienced the nourishment that comes from it, small wonder if you still long for it time and time again. You've experienced it for yourself. No one will take that from you, even if others disagree. Something like that seems to have happened to the people of Israel in the first reading whom Joshua was leading to the promised land. 
Mind you, the journey was a bit long. God had them walking for 40 years in the desert before they got to this point. And so Joshua, true to form, figured he'd test the faith of the people following him while still bearing witness to his own unwavering faith. And so he tells them, if you will not serve the Lord, choose today whom you wish to serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, it was one thing for Joshua to be convinced, yet another for the people he was leading to be convinced as well. We see that in families, with parents. I find that reality as well in parish life all the time. You can never take for granted that people actually either believe or understand what you yourself have come to believe and understand. Joshua, however, wasn't going to base his response, his fidelity to the Lord based on their response and their fidelity, and neither should we. For that matter, we shouldn't be looking to one another and basing our own response on them. However, we see in the first reading that the people responded positively and decisively. They said, we have no intention of deserting the Lord and serving other gods. Was it not the Lord our God, and listen to this, who brought us and our ancestors out of Egypt, who worked those great wonders before our eyes and preserved us along the way. We too will serve the Lord, for he is our God. So you see, their faith was based not only on their leader's faith, but on the collective experience that they had had of God's liberating power and his trustworthiness in their lives. And so should you. They had tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord. They'd known a God who'd acted and intervened to their advantage and in their own personal history, saving them from peril time and time again. And we live in troubled times right now. Like Peter in today's gospel, they'd experienced a God who was for real and that serving him makes them happy. It makes for a happy life, which is basically what we too need to experience for ourselves. You see, people will rarely take a risk on Jesus and trust in him without prior positive personal experience. Take a look, a closer look at that gospel. It's the last section of chapter 6 of St. John. Jesus had just multiplied the loaves and fed the 5,000. Wow, legendary stuff, that. You would have thought that this episode would then end with Jesus riding high on public opinion, but no. Instead, we see this massive rejection of Jesus, and not by his rivals, mind you, or by hostile opponents, but rather by his very own disciples. They didn't get it. We're talking here about the very people who'd witnessed the miracles, marveled at his words, and seen for themselves what Jesus was capable of doing, and yet they simply gave up on him. And why? They told him his language was intolerable because he told them that the real bread they should work for should be his flesh for the life of the world and that anyone who eats his flesh and drinks his blood would live forever. How could anyone accept this, is what they said. Good question. Do you accept it? Jesus was talking about giving his own flesh and blood for them to eat, prefiguring the Eucharist, which we are celebrating, proposing the sacrifice of his life for theirs and for ours. But Jesus knew that the worst was still yet to come for them, that the scandal of his death on the cross was just around the corner, and so he told them, hmm, does this upset you? What if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? For the way that he'd returned to the Father he would ascend via the cross. Jesus, out of crazy, often unrequited love, gave his life as an exchange, a ransom for ours there on the cross. 
liberating us from the bleakness and inevitability of death. Like the people of Israel who had seen the Egyptian army bearing down on them and yet miraculously escaped into freedom, their enemies annihilated before their eyes. Well, that same liberating power of Jesus' cross, annihilating the unrelenting grip of death, will be made continually present in the Eucharist to be eaten and drunk by mere mortals such as us so that we have eternal life. But they couldn't believe him. It all sounded too much a little bit preposterous. But Jesus wasn't talking about his physical flesh, but about the resurrected spirit he would surrender up to us on the cross. For it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh has nothing to offer, he said. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Friends, that same Holy Spirit is with us and still inspires us today. That spirit is transmitted every time the Gospels are read out and the bread and wine consecrated the double table of the Lord, we call it in Mass, giving us the stamina to persevere even if everyone else were to desert him around us. It doesn't depend on them. It depends on your conviction. And remember, faith plus experience equals conviction. Simple mathematics. So in the end, he turns to the 12 and asks, well, what about you? Do you want to go away as well? Are you going to abandon me like the rest? What about us? Are we really so resilient and mature in our faith that we maintain it even in the face of opposition from people around us, even people that love us in our families, despite the unpopularity of faith in other people's eyes in the world today, or what the papers, online blogs, social media say? Ah, but how happy you will be if you respond as Peter responded that day. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we believe. We know that you are the Holy One of God. Friends, Jesus still has words of eternal life for you. Perhaps even in this very Mass, you are hearing them, they are touching you, they're impacting your life. Pray with his words. They will inspire you to do better. Listen to what he has to say and you will gain the courage to accept the crosses that come your way. Well, that's what they do for me. I experience it time and time again. Because Jesus gives us the bigger picture. His cross helps us to see the sense in suffering and sacrifice in us and in our loved ones as being a redemptive force and a ransom in the hands of our God to buy back those who have sold themselves and their eternal lives for worldly offerings. And there are many in that boat. May this love help overcome all the obstacles in, in your way, obstacles, and may we continually taste and see for yourselves how good the Lord really is. For in truth, on this depends a happy life, both here and in the world to come.